that is more likely to produce certain results regardless of a presence of a particular individual that would make specific choices. So let's say that you know, even if we killed baby Hitler and there was nobody there, uh, we could assume that Goebbels or Goering would have risen to the top of the uh, um, of NSDAP, right, the Nazi party, and Create arguments. Um, create arguments. So, um, as a as a sort of pure curricula, as a sort of survey. Um, so, as I said, the sort of one of the most important divisions between uh, in, in shaping an mm -hmm. argument, I think, is to what extent does an individual matter in a particular setting, and to what extent there are structural forces at play which produce that result. And I wanted to ask, what do you think are the other ways in which we can uh, create narratives that concern the same events and the same um, influences, but as a proposition or opposition, we're going to play them as, hey, the structure was the most important thing, or the individual's decision was the most important thing. What other kind of, um, what would you call it, frameworks do you think there can be that exist in, doesn't matter that they exist in history writing, obviously in history writing there are a lot of them, uh, but what other frameworks can you think of that have something to do with uh, two different ways of interpreting the same events? Sorry? Individuals create structures. The individuals create ooh. individuals create structures. Yeah, I mean this is this is basically escaping the paradigm of individual versus structure, that individual is the one that creates structure. I think that's a that's a that's a very legitimate question. What would be the uh, sorry, legitimate framework? What would be the counter framework to individuals create structures? Structures create individuals. Structures create individuals, right? So I think that most people don't tend to I mean, I'm like you know, I'm not saying this was a uh, this was a tricky question, but I don't think most people tend to look at an argument in a debate and say, let's approach it from a framework: was it individual decision shaped by the structure, or was the structure shaping the individual decision? But I think it's actually a really helpful one to look at a debating argument. Yeah. Idea versus tendency, like idea, for example, like a science, the scientist or a politician gives the idea, so the individual does something versus the um, tendency of the society community or whatever that gives the, the yeah the tendency so the like how people act is actually influenced by the society mm -hmm. I mean again this is something that has been incredibly prominent in history writing because there are obviously historians of ideology and um, and they would be the ones who would be saying there is an idea and how this idea has shaped people. So if you look at um, ideology in itself, you would have ideologies like nationalism, you would have ideologies like Marxism or neoliberalism or li li or liberalism or multiple ideologies that we can identify or you know even the Enlightenment. And you can say those were the ideas that made people act. Or on the other hand, you can say that. In, in fact, it is the tendencies in a society. So the fact, for example, that I don't know, women went to work during World War II and during World War One. That so the events on the ground themselves, the pure pure necessity of a historical fact that now there were no men, but men went to war, women had to go to a factory, has produced the idea of feminism to a larger degree. That this ideological tendency spans more from the facts rather than from a thinker who came up with something. And I think again, this is this is something very useful when evaluating different arguments because you cannot be ever for certain sure obviously why things happen or uh, you know what are the outcomes likely to lead to but if you if you um, in your head keep a repository of um, first of all the frameworks like those three that we just mentioned but also few facts from history that you can think of that could be analogous then I believe on the basis of a, on that analogy it is much easier to build an argument I mean, I don't know if you ever struggle with, you know, you get the motion 15 minutes and you're like, my mind is completely blank. So what I do in those circumstances is escape into things that they taught me in school. Hey, here's history and here's a couple of things I've learned from this and that's why I use uh, those frameworks for them. And I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting one in terms of whether, um, whether an idea in itself can inspire people or whether it's a sort of base superstructure <laughs> goes the other way around. Yeah? I think this is a great way to create a case line and to come up with an argument, but what I really struggle with in debating uh, when it comes to, for example, social policy debate is actually proving that my scenario is more probably to happen than the other side, because if the op has you know, any clue of what they're doing, they'll probably clash me on either of these layers. 
idea of tendency structure versus uh, individual, etc. Um, so, and then it's like 50-50, and me as a judge personally, I'm like, please explain me why one is more likely. But how do you, Yes. how would you do it? I mean, so, so the reason I like to talk about um, the sort of bigger ideas behind, the, um, behind argumentation is because from my experience as a judge and as a speaker too, what people struggle more often with is identifying what the debate is about, right? So, I mean, I'm going to move on to answering your question in a moment, but I do think it's useful to consider for a moment what is the debate about, as opposed to how do we prove once we've already established that. But in order to figure out what the debate is about and set a framework that draws the other teams into a comparison, you can win, because obviously you can win once you have prepared in your head that this is the way in which you'd like to approach the topic, and you are going to be right in most circumstances, but as, in, as with history writing, there are multiple ways of going about the question, so there's not necessarily just one right interpretation of the debate. But in order to get what is the gist of the debate or what is the clue of the debate, what the most important debate could be like, and that's why I obviously talk about the bigger ideas. In terms of proving this on a particular case, I mean, the, the problem with the, the answering this question is that with each single motion, the answer is going to be different because you might not need a particular thing to answer a particular question. I mean, the sort of unrelated to history, but the good old uh, formula for that is prove it why it's true and then prove why it's relevant. And uh, you know, that doesn't really answer anybody's questions. But you know, this is this is this is the way people tend to explain what argumentation is often going to be about. Um, but in terms of proving why one framework of looking at things is more likely, um, here I think that um, um, what you need to be able to have is if you look at the sort of like let's say superstructure let's say that our the metric we're going to take is individual versus structure uh, right so who is more important in uh, in a particular setting uh, let's uh, come up with a motion uh, for this where that would be uh, uh, useful right so i mean the individual doesn't have to be an individual it could be a country but like let's say if even if we're talking about um, uh, you know whether obama as a president right these are these sort of old motions uh, that I think, like for example, we said, oh, uh, right. in Budapest, for example, last year we said something along the lines of uh, that Obama should appoint a moderate conservative to the Supreme Court. And right there, I think this is a very interesting case of looking at an individual versus the structure. And similarly, I guess, with people debating whether, you know, what kind of presidency Trump is having or how bad is it for us, I guess the answer to that question would a lot depend on whether you are able to prove that the individual within the American system can do more when they are president, or whether the system in itself is strong enough to be resilient to actions of an individual like Trump. And I think in, in those terms, it's always very useful to look at how many examples can we think of in the past where in different systems, different individuals were able to determine what those systems looked like in the end, and how many of those actually exist. Because I think, personally, that uh, you know, there, there aren't really that many. There aren't really that many systems in which we can say for sure that the individual's um, position within that system allowed them to change the system so much when the system has a semblance of a democracy. In terms of proving those two points separately, I think what you need to be able to do is, um, uh, because you obviously want to stay comparative and everything, um, so I think what you really want to be able to do when you're creating an argument is um, to, first of all, I know I'm going to slightly repeat myself. First of all, frame them all within the logic that we picked for this discussion. So I think it, your burden of proof will become a lot clearer, and therefore your arguments a lot more, um, what would you call it, persuasive, if you've already at the outset said uh, within a, individuals within a system don't have the power to change that system from within unless there is a series of um, a, a series of other factors. And in that case, you could say, you know, once, let's say, if the independent courts don't exist anymore, that's when change can happen. Or when this doesn't happen anymore, uh, or when, uh, uh, or when I don't know, when uh, everybody within the cabinet is also an evil person, then this is when Trump would be actually able to do what he wants to do. With this thing, you push the opposition into proving that, in fact, the courts are going to be not independent, I mean, not every opposition is going to fall for that, but I think in many instances, when you tell them what are the factors you can identify from the past, those people will fall into the trick of having to prove that those particular elements will need to be fulfilled. 
So I think you, because I cannot answer your question really, how do you prove something, what I can tell you is that if you frame the debate in terms of, I think, historical schemas, right, because that's what I sort of think of it because I'm a historian, I think you often identify the key points for the other team. And if you do that, they will be more likely to think that they need to prove those and potentially fail to do so because you will put a burden on them that they perhaps might not be ready for the moment they enter the debate room because that's not what they're expecting. Um, so in that sense, I, I, I think it, 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 it could be useful to um, simply name the forces or the um, aspects of the past that we can identify were important at particular points in time so that when somebody else is trying to rebuttal your case, they have to deal with the weight of what you've just said as are the parameters of the particular debate. Um, again, slightly difficult to say what you would need to do in practice in order to be able to prove that, but I think it's a framework that personally I find fairly gratifying because, uh, I mean, there are many historians in debating, but maybe not that many, and maybe not that many really passionate historians. So most people don't tend to frame their argumentation like this. Um, it might lose you some debates, it might win you some debates, but I think it could win you some debates um, because of the way in which you um, pre-frame the debate uh, to be about, um, um, what would you call it, tendencies that you actually understand. Yeah. Uh, would you only take the framework from history or also state from which example you took the framework within the debate or do um, you think this is unharmed? So I think that so I think that there's um that there will be instances where somebody is judging you and they and you um say you are relating to a particular framework that you've heard from someone about before. And that will put you in, at risk of saying of like whatever you whatever the logical term for this, like you know, but appealing to authority. Yeah. So in that sense, I don't think that you need to waste your time uh, because it might only uh, be a hindrance to your case. Uh, so I don't think that you necessarily need to say that there was a framework for a particular event in the past that has you know, um, inspired you to put the same framework for this debate. But I think it could be useful to have, let's say, three examples where you believe there was an individual in history who's who seemingly mattered a lot, you know, Gorbachev or whatever, like a people, people have a tendency to believe that Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War. A joke, but, you know, somehow a lot of people really actually believe in that. And, um, and you know, if, 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 if you have those examples that you can relate to, um, saying that they have pre-existed in the past and that those misconceptions have been deconstructed, then I think you could have a strengthening of your case by using a historical example. So when you say, for a long time, you know, uh, let's say, I don't know, US foreign, po foreign policy was based on a domino theory, right, that all countries are gonna turn communist, um, which was produced by this crazy woman, uh, and, uh, and, and by many, many academics, and therefore, I don't know, Ronald Reagan invaded countries in Central America. Misguided policy and misguided uh, attempt, but nevertheless he did that and killed a lot of people. Uh, if you, if you, and if you now say that, you know, now we know that this has basically been a misguided, um, um, misguided attempt because the facts that came into evidence, but collected by historians obviously, afterwards were often uh, contradictory or even revealed that they knowingly ignored what the reality was. You can say that you know there is a trend within US foreign policy whereby presidents make decisions to ignore the evidence that exists to pursue agendas within foreign policy. And I think, you know, just saying it happened so with Iraq because America went after the oil would be a pretty standard way of saying this, saying this with a slightly more nuanced historical example and saying that now we know that academia cannot produce an independent research that would be capable of telling us what we're meant to do. Now we know how many um, uh, sectors of society were involved in such a decision and yet the decision was wrong that you, know, you can identify certain trends within that story that lead you towards an argumentation on a completely you know, modern, maybe even hypothetical case of invading a different country, Syria, or you know, anywhere else, and saying, look, here's the mis you, you don't even necessarily need to say here's the mistakes we've made in the past if you don't know them, but if you ever thought about those or were told about those, and you could identify the trends that happened within the cabinet or within um, the political establishment that led to those decisions being made in the past, you can quickly create arguments for why uh, those, the, 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 the extent to which those decisions were misguided 
was also uh, is also a causal um, element in your argumentation. The only risk with that is that you then might be pushed to prove, uh, or somebody might be trying to make you think that what you would need to do in this debate is defend the past and not just the the the, the future. So if you base your argumentation on the very idea, uh, or, or rather, if the basis of your argument is created from the past, then somebody might say, well, actually you were wrong about the past and therefore you're wrong about the future. Now, I don't think this is legit, but you never know your judge, so uh, you never know what they're going to say. And if they do say something like this, that, oh, you just didn't prove your argument because you're based on a historical example, then obviously you will be in the wrong and, uh, and, and will not be winning the debate. So I, so I think that the use of historical examples um, is something that should be done carefully uh, and efficiently in a manner that uh, <laughs> perhaps surprises the other team by demonstrating your knowledge that is relatable and yet not necessarily uh, uh, possible to be pierced very easily. <laughs> I may say it so just diplomatically, yes. And so I, if someone does the like, trap or whatever you called it, that, well, uh, they give me the burden of pr proving them wrong, then they, what do I do? Like, do I just skip it and like, don't worry about like it was a historical example? It may, may not happen like that. So is it all, or do I have to prove? Like, oh, so I think so. I mean, there will be. I think there are debates in which you are very tempted to say this thing happened in the past because it's the best way in which you can prove that your argument is likely to be true. Because what else can you? Sometimes you say obviously there is a lot of factors, but you know the past sort of indicates that these things happen, it is a po possibility. And if somebody tries to contradict you on that or tell you, you need to prove this, I think that the useful response for if somebody tries to nail you on your history is to say uh, the historical example was given to demonstrate the range of factors or the extent to which that analogy has produced, uh, to, to extent, the extent to which that example is analogous to the modern situation is not 100%. It's no, I meant 90 the other side. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. So, so, so if somebody no, so I think that what you, what you, what you say, if somebody tries to tell you, you were wrong. Um, I don't know. Uh, Hitler never wanted to kill the Jews. Then I think what you can say about that is, even if you were right, we don't want to go into this because it's not the subject of this debate. What we brought this example for was so that we could demonstrate to you the range of factors that go into that come into play when such a decision is being made like for example an invasion of a foreign country that did not correspond to my Hitler example but you, you know what i mean that right like you can have you can you can use the historical past as a basis of your argumentation so that you would be able to better come up with arguments and create a clearer framework and if your debate is slightly messy or if it's a difficult question to consider then i think it's legit to sometimes give somebody an idea of what you're talking about by bringing in an example from the past. Uh, but as I, I, was, I was saying before, <coughs> you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky question and I think using history is, is a difficult thing in debating because some, sometimes it backfires on you. But I think there are ways in which it can be used so efficiently that, um, that instead of backfiring it actually furthers your case. So that's sort of what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to say in this workshop. Uh, just Anybody? Oh, yeah. I think what she asked was not what to do when a person tries to falsify your example, but rather when you're the person to whom the example is provided. So you're sitting. Oh, so and somebody yeah, someone, yeah, someone says your example, and they're framing that you know that you have to prove their historical example wrong. So what do you do then? Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, I've I've woken up fairly early, early today, and I sleep on my parents' couch. It's not all that easy. <coughs> so. Um, if, if somebody, so basically if you're on that side where somebody has, it pushes you into the debate you don't want to have. That sort of, that sort of story with uh, the use of historical examples. Okay, so um, I guess the first uh, rule of somebody pushes you into the, a debate you don't want to have is, and I'm definitely not a definite authority, author, authority on this, because I am the person who gets dragged into all sorts of debates that I don't want to get dragged into, uh, just because I like talking. Um, so, you know, I, I would say ask a question to the next people who are going to give workshops what to do when somebody pushes you into a debate you don't want to have. And they are, their answers would definitely be better. My answer to that would be that uh, it, potentially, unless you're opening opposition, you've already made the mistake in that debate by not including a very clear framework. If you are the, right? So, so if you already made that mistake, I mean, the things that you can do are limited. Because if you've already, like, let's say you're the second speaker 
and your partner has already not provided a slightly clearer framework of what your team is after in this debate, what they consider to be the most important questions, and what are they actually going to argue, then it might be a bit more difficult for you to be able to distance yourself from the framework provided by the opposing side. Sadly, that's why strategy matters in the first place, and that's why I think history, history is great to create that strategy in the first place. But if you are um, if you are opening opposition, and the prime minister has stood up and pushed you into a debate you don't want to have, based on you know their thinking of this is the structure for this debate. I, but I mean, first of all, I think to the degree that you have a certainty that they are wrong, if it's like sixty percent even, then I would say reframe it. I mean, there is no, the, the, the entire point of the leader of the opposition, not the entire, but uh, the point of the leader of the opposition is often to reframe the debate and say which parts of it uh, are actually worth proving and which, are, which ones are not. So there will be instances in which you are going to say, the, let's say, okay, let's, let's, let's think of a motion, maybe even unrelated to debating. Uh, anybody has a motion that they're particularly interested in? Uh, okay, so uh, I don't know. Okay, let's do banning zoos, even right. So, so uh, the most uh, ridiculous motion of them all. But let's say that it is, is about banning zoos, and the proposition says mm, uh, we in this debate need to prove two things. First of all, that uh, being in a zoo is a torture for an animal. Second of all, that they have no educational value, right? That there is no that there is no educational value in a zoo. Now, for you as an opposition, let's say that you really like zoos, but not because of their educa um, educational value, but because you believe it's a free for all, right? Because you don't have to, let's say, you don't have to pay access to get into a zoo, at least that's like a case in the, in the zoo, you can walk around it. Um, um, uh, it's a recreational activity that people can have, uh, where entire families can go, it's a way for children to interact with their parents. So you don't want to actually argue about the educational, um, educational value of a zoo, because you can see a picture of a tiger in a book anyway. So in that case, you are completely legitimate in saying that the framework of the proposition is wrong, because in this case, they base their, they, they, they want to uh, make, it, make it seem like if they're the only ones defending education, like if you were not, because they're defending the educational value. And if you are not smart about this, and you are trying to prove that Zoos do not have an educational value, or whatever, because you know you don't you, because uh, because you agreed to the framework of the proposition. Then you won't. You might a either not have the time to talk about your own arguments, or b uh, you might not bring about your own most important arguments and say that this is actually the metric on which we should decide this debate. So if you are opening opposition and somebody gives you two areas in which they think they need to win this debate in order to be, I mean, they need to prove in order to be able to win this debate. I don't see a reason in 99% of the cases, if you very much believe that, that, that they are putting you in an impossible position, to point that out and say that actually this debate is, does not come down to whether zoos can educate people, but whether we need zoos in order to be able for families to have recreational time on the weekends uh, and you know families that don't have enough money to have a happy time together. Stupid example, but the, the essence of this is that, I, that there is no reason why you wouldn't um, say that. And if somebody pushes you into, if somebody gives you historical, oh yeah, actually maybe, that's, that's sort of like a big next thing, but if somebody gives you historical examples you've never heard of, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, first of all, likelihood, the judge does not know about that either. So unless you, unless the debate, uh, unless let's say you are competing at Worlds or Euros and they happen to be in a particular country, so like, you know, Warsaw Euros, I actually don't even remember because I was running around, so I don't remember what the motions were, but let's say there was a motion about Poland, or like for sure, Zagreb Euros, there was a motion about like generally ex-Yugoslavia. Now in that case, I think it's illegitimate for you to claim, to think that the judge knows nothing about the history of Yugoslavia, because people do matter prep. Uh, uh, prep matter, Jesus, yeah. Do people do um, um, learn stuff about the countries they go to for major competitions. So in that case, I think, you know, do brush up your facts before you go, also about history a bit, and not knowing that the Yugoslav wars happen, probably illegitimate reason for discounting an argument or escaping right argumentation, like saying, no, 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 we don't need to concern about this because you know they invented this fact, or we can we have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. Because you are an ex-Yugoslav and you should know about this, because like most people would. Um, but if it is a you know who was the king of Poland in the 16th century? probably nobody cares and probably nobody should have known. So in this particular setting, definitely no reason to relate to those historical arguments because the judge wouldn't know them. Best, best way to, to, to assess whether you need to know the history of something is not whether you know this, but 
if you think about an event, and let's say, okay, the Yugoslav, Yugoslav wars, right, happens in the 90s. What happened, what, what is there in the 90s? Media, really, really prominent media already and a lot of print. Now then, like, everybody would know about this and there's a lot of evidence and, a lot, and there's a lot of interest in something like this. Uh, and therefore, you can safely assume that it's a fact that most people should be assumed to know. If it's about the 16th century Poland, and whether it was a tolerant, and you know, somebody says, Poland has a history of tolerance because we didn't burn any witches, uh, or something like this, then I think that's not necessarily something that you have a basis to judge that most people would know about, because you probably were taught that in school, and Brilliant Polish National School will teach you one version of history, and that's what you will remember from this, right? So, so I think that the, the best way to answer, do you respond to something that pertains to history within a debate, is to say, how would people know about this fact, or this alleged fact from history, and whether the way in which they would know would come from a national curriculum of a particular country? Most likely the judge will not know about that in an international setting. If you are on a national tournament, obviously different story. If you are in a, in a setting that uh, presumes that type of knowledge, uh, you know, there are literary, comp like there are competitions where, which are based on books, so that if you didn't know the book that the debate is on, then obviously you, you wouldn't really be doing very well in that competition, first of all, but second of all, it would be illegitimate to claim that you should not know about this. Um, but best case, be best way I think to assess is, why do we know about something that has happened, and if we know about this from a source that should be discounted as biased, then many people might not know about this either. And therefore, probably no need for you to bother with like wasting time on on, uh, on rebutting something like this. Um, yeah. Anybody has any other questions? And then Q and A session. Um, actually, I'll check what time. Doing with my um, incessant talking. Oh, okay. So, like, maybe very briefly because we need my Q and A first. Um, I don't, does, uh, did anybody study nationalism and theories of nationalism? I think it's a really fascinating topic, and the reason I want to say this is because I think it's a it's like a useful way of looking at history as well. So, um, in, so, so there are multiple competing conceptions of what nationalism is, and in a debate, um, proving that somebody acts on a basis of ideology is going to be something that, as we've already said, might happen to you, or you might want to pursue that kind of a, um, that kind of an argumentation line. And I actually think that this very uh, confusion about where does nationalism come from as a phenomenon and the huge academic debate that surrounds that is a fairly <laughs> paradoxically useful way of going about thinking why does ideology matter. Because it's probably nationalism might be one of those examples that you everybody will know. Uh, I mean, different, uh, different instances of nationalism will be the very few examples that people actually know and would be able to relate to where they seemingly don't find an explanation as to why do people believe in a particular ideology. Now, when it comes to um, like scholarship on the subject, there are, like let's say, three dominant theories, which is not really uh, super important here, but like one of them obviously states that it's a primordial uh, thing and that people are just divided into nations. Uh, the second one is sort of like ethnosymbolism, so that one uh, talks about how there are um, there is like a repository of remnants from the past which are then galvanized into building a national identity. Uh, so you would need to be able to have a national myth in order to be able to build a nationality. And the third one uh, sort of talks about how it's a, an, an, a modern phenomenon and the radical proponents of that would be saying it's basically because people were sent to factories, for example, or basically because if there was modern warfare, only in the 20th century total wars with mass armies, where people for the first time interacted with each other, or modern schooling, where only after modern schools were created people started learning uh, one language, that's where nationalists come from, because that's the first time that you actually can have a sense of a nation. Prior to that, you would only have maybe a sense of a community. But, importantly, even, in, even those modern scholars would say you would have a sense of community. And I think that this ambiguity within the study of nationalism by itself, I think it's a remarkably fascinating field. Uh, because you would be, I mean, I was surprised by how many examples there are mm, of different ways in which nationalism formed in different countries. Uh, but more importantly, for like a debating purpose, um, I think that nationalism um, and ha knowing, I don't know, one or two examples of uh, for how those three theories are seen as true could be very helpful in establishing the parameters for proving that people are likely to either believe in, uh, in a superstructure that they don't necessarily have a reason to believe in. Uh, the, second, um, the second thing that I think could be useful from 
from, from like the studies, why do we believe in nationalism, uh, is whether, um, is uh, talking about the European Union, and I guess this is a topic of debating uh, still and will be for quite some time, and I think there, there are really interesting examples. Of, for example, uh, so in Hungary, Viktor Orban has been set to um, um, uh, had, had a remark that the certain so the certain nationalism in Hungary actually came from well, according to some scholars, obviously, I think it's a, actually a very good argument. But um, uh, the certain nationalism in Hungary came from the fact that during around the when Hungary was about to join the EU, all the mainstream parties converged on the idea that they want to join the EU. So there was nobody that really opposed it. And even if they did, they weren't a mainstream political force. So based on that, the membership in the EU, uh, the, 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 like Orban's uh, um, narrative, very easily joined, um, uh, very easily um, created itself based on the idea that, look, everybody else has betrayed you. Because once the EU stopped being the most beautiful thing, or once people already discovered that, like, you know, actually they're not getting rich from one day to the other. I'm not saying that the EU is bad, I actually quite like it, but, uh, but the idea is that, like, you know, it wasn't like that, everything changed, and people still have grievances. Then Victor Orban was able to say, oh, look, all the mainstream parties have failed you. And that, in itself, has been a way for him to be able to further on build on the nationalist cause. Because then, um, um, in the EU, he appealed to the, well, Hungary is already in the EU, he appealed to the people who like the EU and like the fact that they have joined uh, by saying, look, now our homeland uh, actually includes all of our minorities which are spread around <laughs> different countries. So, for example, Romania has a large Hungarian minority and it's like, oh, look, with all the countries in the EU, our Hungarians are actually, you know, are coming back home. That's why the EU membership is good. That's what he told the people that like the EU. The people that, he didn't like the, uh, that didn't like the EU, he told, oh, look, the other parties betrayed you. So, based on this sort of like very broad series of circumstances, he was able to appeal to very different, um, um, very different demographics to convince them that the EU is both good and bad at the same time. A surprisingly nuanced case, I would say, uh, for the type of government that that is. And I think that the, um, that the sort of lesson from that is that you know, modern nationalism in itself still bears the features of this sort of like old nationalism. People have that sense of irredentism, so the lands they want to reclaim, the, um, the, the, their own minority, uh, minority ethnic communities that they want to be able to feel a part of their homeland. The people actually still think about the world very much in those terms, and the diasporas that exist are the new component of the study of nationalism, and something that in debating, I think, is incredibly uh, useful because it is increasingly something that will be present in argumentation. With more people migrating around the globe, you will continuously have those diasporas, and looking at how world leaders construct the narratives around, hey, what do we do about the fact that we need to either you know, defend the polls in the Great Britain after racist attacks on them, or what we need to do in order to be able to uh, protect our minorities abroad, and what kind of structures it necessitates for the modern world, and why that means that they wouldn't want to get rid of the EU, for example, uh, right, in, a, in, a, in some sort of a debate, because that's the best way they can argue for the defense of their minority abroad something that people care about because they're still nevertheless nationalist, I think those trends within um, sort of like the academic study of nationalism can be really useful for, um, for creating debating cases that um, um, in, in the
because it's something that you know is a feature of humanity uh, and as as such can be used in debating if you want to if you want to end on that note to often explain people's behavior because um, if people do have a sense of a past and want to know that they know their own past then they will nevertheless care even though they cannot explain it and um, it serves as a motivation and as a motivation can be used in a debating context to prove somebody's likelihood of um, acting in a particular way or um, um, deciding in a particular way. Okay, cool. That was a very uh, sobby speech at, at the end uh, <laughs> about debating. So if nobody has any questions, which is fair enough, uh, I will uh, conclude my sort of workshop on our history. Since we still have like eight minutes, oh, yeah, then sure. maybe you can turn to the monumental part as well. Oh, monumental, yeah, sure. Um, it's another oh, yeah. question towards um, what we just talked about. Um, I mean, mostly in Europe, or basically all around the world at the moment, there are a lot of parties rising that use, use nationalism for their uh, right-wing populist ideas. Um, and I, while I can see the empirical evidence for it, I kind of find it hard to explain what reasons there are for this particularly large group of people actually behaving in such a way. Do you actually know, or do you have any sort of mechanisms as a historian so, that you could provide? Yeah, so I mean, so the reason, so, so as a historian, right, depending on what kind of historian you are, you would approach it in a different way. Uh, let's say that this happened in the past. I, because I tend to be what is called Marxist, but purely in a sense that it's interdisciplinary, uh, historian, and I like social and economic history. So the t factors that I tend to look at, and like when I do my own historical research, I really like to focus on this. I like to focus on what are the economic circumstances in which people find themselves. And it's not like uh, the sort of orthodox Marxist theory of, you know, the base creates a superstructure, but more what I mean to say is that I think that the slightly more long-term trend of political decisions which produced certain material conditions for groups of people and conceptualizing, conceptualizing, conceptualizing culture as a material component of that is probably useful, right? So um, whether material conditions uh, together with a different distinct cultural identity can produce a different result than material conditions themselves. Right? I think it's a legitimate question to have. Because if you look at, so, so to, get, to get an example of this, if you, are, uh, um, if you are a disgruntled French voter, what you were taught in your history curriculum was, uh, actually I know the least probably about the French history curriculum, because I don't speak French, but uh, you were probably taught a lot of, not necessarily hatred, but you were taught this very complex history of France and Germany being very intertwined. So many wars, uh, and yet so much cooperation afterwards. So you would have that sort of like Western backdrop to your education. Then you would have the imperial French history um, about the minorities. Uh, you would have uh, also the history of how, uh, of you know, the French Revolution and Napoleon. And these will be the primary factors based on which you um, shape your worldview of what France is meant to be. And I think this is really where the sort of interconnection between those um, Mm, between those two, uh, between the material factors and the cultural factor uh, factors happens. So if you are not French, you will not have gone to a French school. You will not have an idea of what France is supposed to look like based on the things they taught you in school. You would have a very different idea of Fra what France is meant to look like. I probably don't have a very particular view of this. Even if I do, mine would be more like, you know, I'd like it to be a democratic state, yada, yada, yada. Those things, that's what I'm going to say. And I think the moment that you know you look at economic conditions, which could disprove to you the idea that France is meant to be based on like you know Napoleon's civil code, where everybody's equal, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity. Let's say the slogan of the French Revolution. Then you're going to, I think, look at your own personal uh, economic and social circumstances in a very different way than a person who was never taught that égalité, fraternité is the most important thing that he can experience as a nation, or that's what your the nation is meant to be. So I do genuinely believe that uh, looking at modern Europe, I do, I've done a project on comparing history textbooks. I didn't do that, I didn't include France in that because I don't speak any French and didn't have any friends who did, but we compared a lot of textbooks, like um, primary school, secondary school textbooks in different co European countries. And what we noticed was that, like, you know, they, they cover completely different things. That, that there's like no, they're, they're, like, that there's no way in which that history is actually a European one. And uh, it's, it's basically a national history and this, the, the, it, it always has an agenda. 
or you only discover it has an agenda when you've compared the two textbooks and you're like, wow, that is an agenda. I never really thought about this, but this, this, is, like, you know, this piece of like, supposedly historical facts is actually a compilation of proofs why our nation should look in a particular way. So I think that the sort of modern European right-wing movements do actually, I, I think it would be stupid to ignore within them the historical context uh, sorry, not the historical context in the sense of what actually happened in France or what actually happened on the ground or what are the actual historical facts, but the historical context of you went to school, you have, a, you have an education, that education included history lessons, those history lessons created an image of what you want your state to look like and what you deserve and what is justified as a state, and I think you base your image of what you want France to be like on the sort of things that you've learned in history classes. I have no proof of this, <laughs> obviously, because I don't think anybody can really prove this, but I think that you can, based on this, construct a lot of narratives about why people behave in certain manners, um, and the way in which they imagine their community based on key characteristics they were given from a, from a history textbook. And I, and I obviously think that, they, that it's very hard to compare it now to actual living conditions, and, and the first basis on which you decide that the story you were meant to live is not actually there for you is based on that comparative between the history textbook and, and what happens around you at this point in time. But, you know, that's sort of my view on this. I don't think uh, there's definitely a lot of much but better <laughs> explanations for this uh, than what I just said. But yeah, I think so as well. Um, I don't know, does anybody disagree with me? Because I don't know, I don't know if I'm like either talking too fast or saying things that you already know or saying things you don't care about. Uh, well, not disagreement, but I think that it's a very interesting perspective how you look at the rise of nationalism through just only cultural perspective and how cultural historical background is the key cultural thing why nationalism rises, because I believe there are like five other much more important factors, but that's like just an issue of debate, and I highly understand your perspective, and it's a very interesting one, Sometimes it's very serious. No, I mean, like, you know, I, I, I genuinely think there's a lot of other really important factors yeah, yeah, in that, and I would never sort of want to, you know, flatten the story into saying you're taught history in school and therefore that's how your life looks like. I think that would be naive, to say the least. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that people tend to sort of ignore the part where you go to school and that school gives you an education and, and, and uh, the, you know, the modern, the, the scholars of nationalism who said modernity is the most important factor in creating nationalism and the ethno-symbolists, the ones who said you need the past but it also happens in modernity, I think that basically what they were hinting at is, was always saying, you, you, you have that repository of the past, uh, an image that exists back there, and even if it's fake, it can still be the basis of your identity, because it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. What matters is whether the modern standards which needed you to be a unified nation, speaking one language, being able to fight in one army, being able to go and die in a field just because you had an idea of a nation, whether those things were strong enough to convince you in the 1920s and 1930s, and 1940s really more, right? Uh, but 1910s, that doesn't really exist, but you know, First World War and Second World War, these things were able to convince you. It wasn't always that you were forced to go to the army, you also were convinced. And I think it begs the question of, if we today say that Marine Le Pen has nothing to do with um, the ideas behind nationhood, but only is purely a um, reactionary force to, uh, of angry people who, for example, right, cannot deal with modernity because they, because of whatever other reasons we give, I think that if they didn't know what they were aspiring to, they wouldn't be drawn to a particular scenario. Because why would they be drawn to that and not to, as I would like to imagine it, the left? Right? Why wouldn't they not be drawn to the left? Because they don't have a comparative example from the past to which they can relate. So like, basically what you're saying is that almost all the things we know are things that we were told. Uh, well, I mean, I generally, generally speaking, believe that I don't think there is a capacity for a human brain yeah. to know more than what yeah, we Yeah, yeah, like it, that's like you... But I think it's a... So I you're coming from the perspective that, well, you're taught something, and then you know what you're taught. So. I, I, I think that it might be also a subconscious thing, in that, like, I don't think most people ever rethink their primary education. Uh, yeah. Or rather, I never thought my biological primary education, because I don't care, and I probably was told, you know, some lies, went to a Polish school. What they taught me, I have no idea. I also do not remember this, but there were definitely some things within this which had a tendency. And I would not be able to tell you what the tendency was, because uh, I think most, you know, there are facts, and the repository of facts is, is unending. So if you have to teach somebody something, somebody the basics, you obviously will have to make a choice. It's impossible to teach somebody everything. So each education has to have an agenda in the sense that 
being in school means choosing facts you're going to learn means there needs to be something that binds those facts together, some, some process of selection. Okay. And that process of selection might not be biased, but I believe it has to be. Uh, <laughs> or I believe it has always been. Uh, because nationalism, to a large extent. Because a lot of states created um, common history, uh, like unified history curricula, or sorry, not just history, unified curricula, so that they could have a workforce that is capable of performing certain tasks. And I think citizenry that is capable of making certain choices and agreeing to certain scenarios. Um, I, I think it's a, pop, it's a popular strand within like history writing, right, to say things like this. Uh, but I sort of tend to agree with this as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think social being very much. Yeah. So I have a perspective question to you. Yeah. So uh, right, you know that in many schools in Europe right now we have uh, two types of programs, the national ones and the ID ones, which are mm -hmm. more and more popular. Do you think uh, in about a period of 40 and 50 years that people could learn the national school, you know, we're talking in, in the national curriculum where, where it will be far more nationalistic, significantly nationalistic than their counterpart schools who, who you know, took the curriculum of ID? I think it's a really interesting question in that I, so I think programs like Erasmus, right, so like to build on that, programs like Erasmus are really good. I really do think that, like, so living in Britain for four years, I do have a slight feeling that the fact that people don't go abroad matters a lot, that they don't go abroad in order to see other cultures and see other places. It's not a thing that we do a lot. Erasmus is not that widely available as it tends to be in Poland. I also don't know necessarily whether it's actually that available, but my images of education in Europe, that like programs of exchange are a bit more common in continental Europe than in Britain. And I think it does matter, right, as a, as a, as a, in terms of creating people's perception. In terms of the programs, that what, so what is the difference between IB and a national curriculum? It is, uh, IB is constructed around choices that teachers can make and that classrooms can make in terms of the material that they study. And, um, uh, and national curriculum is unified to the point where the selection is rarely available to you if you are meant to be taught a particular chunk of history, you're going to be taught that. Uh, also, the IB doesn't make you take certain subjects. Different education system will make you take them. So that's why I think the question is incredibly complex and obviously the differences will vary. So the different personalities that you might develop from that education, I think will vary between individuals who have decided to gone through a track of, let's say, you know, took history as a part of their IB, uh, 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 IB school, and individuals who have not taken history but have taken only, uh, I don't know, but have taken psychology. So because in IB you have that selection of subjects, which you, I believe, don't always have to the same degree in a let's say, uh, a European school, but what you do have is the choice of exams you're going to write, not the subjects you're going to study necessarily, but exams you're going to write. Uh, it, I think it produces different results, although in Greece you have to study it all, uh, in most instances. Like, you, the, their, their exams have a lot of different, um, a lot of different subjects. Uh, what I do think it is um, meaningful in terms of creating, you know, how we will you look at the world, is in the case of IB and not IB, um, the opportunities that you're going to be given afterwards. And I, I, think, I think here, I mean, you know, I'm agreeing more with you. I actually think that this economic component of that system is very important. I am not meaning to say that you cannot do well in IB or do well after, you know, graduating from high school if you're from a lower socioeconomic background. God, no, I wouldn't say that, but I think your chances are reduced because sometimes you might not be able, your parents might not be able to afford to support you in whatever path you choose. Uh, and I think that can matter in the way in which you either construct your uh, relationship with um, uh, uh, the sense of opportunity, so the sort of like tenet of capitalism, for example, right? Uh, whether you believe that um, the American dream is going to be true, might, your relationship with that might be different. So not necessarily what you were taught in that school, but the types of opportunities that that type of education produces, I think, could be a very important factor in this. Do I think that people who tend to, uh, the sort of third culture kids, right? People who tend to generally grow up among, uh, with traveling parents or something like this, that they don't tend to have a sense of nationalism, I agree. Um, I think if from a young age, I mean, obviously this is slightly empirical and slightly like, you know, I only read some really probably shady articles at some point in my life about this. I do think that like the term third culture kid was produced so that we could describe people who don't have a sense of a national identity. 
because they were not top one. So, you know, sort of proves my point that I think it's really important that you go to a school in a particular place. But migrants and diasporas tend to have a very nationalist relationship with their home countries. So diasporas will often vote more nationalist uh, than, uh, than uh, their compatriots who are still living in a country. And I think this could be sometimes explained by the idea of the nation that they grew up with that is very imaginary and, um, and that is uh, very idealistic. This sort of constructed imagined community, uh, where with diaspora can because they don't have the point of comparative of living in the particular place. So I would say that the trend can go both ways. You can easily become a very nationalist person by pursuing, uh, let's say, by being schooled in an international agenda, because then you say, aha, no, but like, you know, the only thing that I ever really knew was my national culture. And in some cases, it will be the precise opposite, was this the point of the national culture? Uh, so, I, I mean, it's just, I don't think that there's, there is a way to really answer that question for certain because it is true that education, despite things that I said before, is not necessarily the most critical factor in your upbringing. Your parents could be more important and your everything else could be more important. <laughs> um, but, but, but the awareness of the international aspect of, uh, of the world, or that the world is a slightly more complex place because you traveled around, I think is really important and I think it tends to make people uh, more tolerant uh, as, a, as a general tendency. It has nothing to do then with being a diaspora, like an established diaspora, but being generally internationally placed, I think, tends to make you slightly more tolerant towards the idea that other people have legit ways either of considering their own national identity or of, of admitting that maybe the national identity is just, you know, something you do not understand at all. And being even slightly, um, what would you call it, like looking down on people who actually have one. Um, I think all of those things are equally possible. I mean, are ways of argumentation that I think you could pursue, and I think you could find a lot of reasons why they're legitimate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you had a question. Yes. Yeah, so I was thinking about the last question. Yeah. Uh, and like, so when you were doing your your um, research on like history textbooks, was there a correlation uh, between like countries that have um, more like nationalistic feelings and the amount of the national history that can affect the books? Um. So uh, I mean, first of all, this is non. Uh, this was my, me, undergraduate student, wants to talk to my friends and compare the textbooks. No, absolutely no, uh, what would you call it, like uh, objective value in that research, in that I cannot make any claims that actually would be real because I never had any money or time to be able to actually conduct research properly. I do think that there are some studies. And um, if you are interested in the Balkans, there is this foundation called Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in the Balkans, which is a fantastic charity which produces common textbooks for a couple of countries in the Balkans. They're available in national languages, and they uh, have headquarters in Thessaloniki, and uh, if you were ever interested, I do have the copies of their textbooks, which are the supranational textbooks that they created and they're trying to implement in schools. Uh, obviously, that charity also produced a lot of research into what are the textbooks that currently exist. I would say two things about this. I don't think that there is an extent to which national history can be measured how much there is of a national history, because as an individual, how would you ever assess the extent unless you have a point of comparison? Uh, and depending on the size of your country, the important events that happen within this, what are you going to tell a British person who has studied, uh, which is actually, in fact, largely not true. I could talk about the British education system, which actually has a fascinating way of teaching history. But, uh, but you know, let's say that the, the British curriculum no longer is a sort of imperial curriculum, but it used to be. But now my question is, how can we condemn people who sort of taught the imperialist cur curriculum in British schools if in some you know, weird sense, in some disturbing sense, Britain was an incredibly important country in world history. There was just so many things that they were instrumental in. So teaching the national past in that sense, would, in, in, in that context, somehow seems a lot more justified. What if you are Andorra? I don't know, I'm not sure you have one. Uh, probably that was really offensive, I'm sorry. You probably do, I just don't really know much about this. But you know, you won't be able to make the same sort of a claim. So, mm, I, I don't think you can actually measure the extent to which the national past is a national past uh, with an agenda just because it concerns your nation. Uh, but I do think it makes a difference. Uh, the two things make a difference in terms of the, like, the level of nationalism experience in a particular country is, um, I think, the extent to which historical discourse features in the political, uh, sorry, historical uh, 
realm in general features within the political discourse. And I think that often has roots in how much value there is placed in the educational system on the history curriculum and how much of it is important. And, uh, and I do think that you know, the stuff that we didn't actually get to talk about, but the public commemorations and the sort of, what would you call it, reinforcements of that historical past that you've studied in school, how many of those exist in a society? Because there is a difference between uh, you know, going to school, having your history taught to you between the ages of, let's say, 6 and 12, and then you can drop it. And then even if though it might have been the most nationalist agenda in the world, you could have forgotten it all. But if you live in a country that also commemorates that past, regularly and um, devotedly, then I think the chances of you remembering what you were taught at school are a lot more higher. I'm not saying that all commemorations are wrong, but they do tend to reinforce the idea that the past matters and that you should have a relationship with it. Uh, so I think that nationalism in a sort of modern sense uh, cannot exist without that repository of historical facts that you were taught at some point, but I don't think the textbook in itself can determine fully the extent to which you could predict, let's say, what kind of nationalism will you experience in a particular country, uh, or to what extent will you experience a nationalism in a particular country. I think that the factors there at play uh, do generally discount the idea that a very nationalist curriculum will produce a very nationalist nation. I don't think that you would find a correlation like this, but again, um, you know, non-authoritative research, um, not sure about that at all. Um, well, actually, Interesting question, we'll try to find out. Probably impossible, but it could be. Uh, so thanks, I'll look, at, look into this. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Okay, I think I've talked more than an hour. Um, but I'm glad you're interested in the history part of this. I do think that regardless of the fact that some of it doesn't seem like it's useful in debating, it actually is. Um, I think considering those questions and the narratives and, or the, the ways in which we can construct responses to questions like this, I think that they are basically a very Mm, useful thing to know, or a useful process to engage in when then engaging in a debate. Uh, personally found it useful. Not sure you will, but you know, never know. You've only wasted an hour of your life, so worst case scenario, it's not too bad. Uh, but yeah, it was fun talking to you. If anybody wants to talk more about history and nationalism in general, then you know, uh, anytime, I'm always happy to talk, uh, very clearly. And um, I lead you to the next workshop, because presumably Verti is here to deliver it. And um, yeah, I, uh, and good luck in the tournament and have fun. Most importantly, obviously. Mm -hmm.